Yes, hi, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. It's really nice to see so many of you here. We have quite a big crowd here for this tutorial. And I'm really happy and really excited to be part of PyCon. And I'm sure the same is true for my co-host uh, for today, Fadim, as well. I'd like to start out with introducing the both of us. Um, maybe, Fadim, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, sure. So my name is Vadim. You'll hear more from me in the second part uh, when it'll come to my turn. We are both working at a uh, Godet-driven organization based in the Netherlands and Europe, um, doing all kinds of um, data science related training and consulting assignments. And I personally work as a consultant these days, um, did quite a lot of trainings in the past. Uh, well, I guess I'll mention more later when it comes to my turn. Yeah, thanks, Fadim. Um, and I'm Marisha, like Fadim already said. We both work for Go Data Driven. I have a background um, in artificial intelligence from the University of Amsterdam. We're both based in Amsterdam. And I have approximately five years of industry experience, mostly in deep learning. I have to say deep learning for the medical field, um, but also as a data scientist and data science educator right now. But we don't only just want to introduce ourselves. We also want to le learn a little bit about who of you are in this crowd. We are with 23 here, that's quite a lot. But if you can join us at this link, which will be put into the chat as well, it's gdd.ly slash poll. You'll see uh, a prompt to enter your name that won't be used, you can fill in anything, and also a couple of questions. And I'm really interested to see how you answer these questions to get a kind of an indication of who's in here. The link is in the chat currently, so I'll switch my screen to the poll results. And as soon as people start to fill in these polls, I see someone has two to four years of experience with Python. We can see the answers appearing here. 10 plus years, someone. Already three responses. So the question is, what is your experience with Python? And the possible answers are zero to one years, you're just starting out, about two to four years, quite comfortable, five to 10 years, really pretty experienced. And surprisingly, there's still people in here that have 10 plus years of experience. That means that they remember a time before Python 2.7, which was released, if I remember correctly, June uh, 2010. Oh, unfortunately, some people seem to not be able to find the server. Um, but I do see that a lot of you are filling this out. So for All folks, right, let's... For folks who are having issues with the poll, I'm wondering if it's a VPN slash, yeah, it looks like it has been posted again. Yeah, and if you don't, if, if you feel comfortable, you're also welcome to type in the chat your level of Oh experience. yeah, definitely. All right, I don't see many more ex people answering the questions here. I do see some people that can answer it in the chat. Let's move on to the next one. What is your job? This means, are you a data scientist? Are you a data engineer? Are you um, just a backend engineer, front end engineer? What, how would you describe what would be your job title? And as people answer this question, we'll get a word cloud to get a kind of idea who's in here. Network engineer, I see. Consultant, technical. So engineer seems to be the biggest word in here, not surprising. Also seem to be some data scientists, network security data. But engineering, mostly at sea. All right, really nice to see. Let's move on to the next question. Where are you from? 
So Fadim and I, we're based in the Netherlands. Uh, me in Amsterdam, Fadim somewhere else, but we both work in Amsterdam. So the majority is in the U of the participants are in the US. One from Europe. All right, the majority in the US. And that leads us to the last question that we have, which is, what are you hoping to gain from this tutorial? Uh, we're doing a tutorial in time series and maybe you um, uh, have never worked with time series before and you wanna see what we have to say. Maybe you're already comfortable analyzing time series we would like to learn specifically more about modeling and forecasting. Maybe you've done both of those already, but you're hoping to pick up a few new tips and tricks or some, you don't know why you picked this tutorial, but it sounded nice. All right, it seems like the majority of the people in here, we see the numbers changing a little bit, but the majority have never worked with time series before. Um, I think that's, uh, and uh, about 25% is comfortable analyzing time series, but would like to learn more about forecasting and modeling. Well, we'll talk about both of these aspects, actually. I'm going to thank you very much, all of you, for answering. Uh, it gives us a bit of an idea of who we're dealing with. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. And it actually leads me to introduce time series as a concept. So a series, just a regular series can be defined as a number of events or objects or people of a similar or related kind coming after one of each other. And if you add a dimension of time to that, we get a time series where the data is collected over a regular interval in time and can be ordered chronologically. So a time series can be defined as a series of data points in time order. And because of this temporal aspect that we now have, the statistical characteristics of time series data can often violate the assumptions of conventional statistical methods. Because of this, analyzing time series data requires a unique set of tools and methods. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So there are two primary uses or focuses we'll have today uh, of time series. Anal analysis on the one hand and forecasting on the other hand. Analysis will be about using our data to explain and understand the past, the data, and highlighting the behavior and uh, patterns of the data. And that lays the foundation for building a reliable, a reliable model for forecasting. Because from inventory to website visitors to resource planning or financial data, time series is really all around us. And knowing what comes next is key to success. So in this tutorial, we'll touch upon the basics of both time series analysis and using PANAS to analyze a time series data set, as well as using these insights for time series modeling and forecasting. So we'll start out with the introduction, which is where we are now. We'll, I will be covering time series analysis with PANAS, the package that we'll be using for that. Uh, we'll have a little break in between then because it's a long session. So we'll have two 10 minute breaks and we'll have a break before Fadim can pick it up with mo and we'll talk about modeling with time series. And after we've discussed that, we'll have a bigger challenge. And that challenge basically means that we discussed a couple of concepts and we introduced you to some material and we want to give you the opportunity to work on a time series project. And we'll be making sure that you can work together with other people. So we'll divide you into breakout rooms if possible. And you can work together with two or three other people and work on this challenge. And you'll have some time to practice as well. And then Vadim will finalize, kind of reiterate what we talked about and highlight some interesting other things you might be interested in. But I'm going to start with the time series analysis with PANDAS. And let me go to the next slide. You'll notice that these two links are the ones, if someone could put them in the chat, um, that will give you access to the material. So the first link is the link to a GitHub repo where all the material that we'll be using, all the Jupyter notebooks that we'll be using is located. And the second link 
is a link to Binder, which is an interactive environment where the notebooks are already loaded. Uh, you can click them and you can execute everything without having to set up your own environment for yourself. So pick whichever one you prefer. Um, I saw that previously there were a couple of problems with the gdd.li link. So if it doesn't work, maybe someone can put the full link in the chat as well. I see the full link to the GitHub is already there. Maybe also the full link to the binder. Thank you very much, Ryan, for, uh, for putting the links in there. And that should, so the GitHub, you can download all the material, start your own environment. We're not using a lot of um, difficult packages that you don't have, probably don't have installed, but you can set up your own virtual environment and run the notebooks. Or if you don't want to deal with that hassle, you can use the binder. All right. Um, if you're using the binder, it takes a little bit of time to start up, um, but you should be able to see three different notebooks that we have in there. One on time series analysis, one on modeling, and one hackathon, which is the challenge that we'll finish today with. I'm going to move on to the first notebook, which is the one about time series analysis. And I suggest that I think the best way to follow along with this tutorial is to see what I'm doing on my screen and follow along on your own personal laptop, PC, see and execute the cells as we go along and maybe make the changes that you want to try out to familiarize yourself with the material a little bit. So it's not just me talking. Like I said before, I'm going to talk about time series analysis with Pandas. Fadim will be covering more of the modeling and forecasting side. And the goal of my part here is to familiarize ourselves with working with time series data in Pandas. Uh, Pandas is the data manipulation and analysis package for Python. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with Pandas. We do hope that you at least know how to, well, the basics of Pandas, how to read in the files, but we won't cover anything that's too specific, only about time series. And in order to familiarize yourself with working with time series, we'll be using a real time series data set to learn some of these fundamental analysis techniques. So I'll first cover some time utilities in Panda, just the basics. You might already be familiar with daytime, but how do we do this in Pandas specifically? Then, Reading in time series data, for instance, from a CSV file, and how do you deal with that in Spanda specifically? Some time-based manipulations, such as easy aggregations, shifting, time-based features. And finally, we'll talk about rolling and smoothing. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is time series utilities in Pandas. So there are various ways to work with time series data, but Pandas, in our experience, is the nicest way to do this. But before we can move on to how do you work with actual data that you import from a CSV file, for instance, I kind of want to highlight something about timestamps in Pandas. Like I said, you might already be familiar with daytime. And in Pandas as well, you can create daytime data from strings formatted in a specific way using PD timestamp. Let me just, just quickly check. Don't forget to import pandas and numpy up top before you move on, otherwise the code won't work. So it's really easy to create a date, a variable date with uh, pandas, with pd, the name that we import used for the import for pandas, and timestamp. And you notice that we first have the year, then the month, the ninth month, the day, and then we have the separator T to indicate the exact time. And because it was formatted like this, we can easily, using this variable over here, print stuff like the date and the time individually. But in addition to that, you can also do some other operations that you may have already seen, but maybe not in Panda specifically, such as subtracting one timestamp for another. In this case, for instance, we have uh, 2020, second month, 20th day, and a specific time. Here we have the second month, February, the 18th day, and a different time. And we see that we actually have a time delta of 
two days and approximately 10 minutes and 24 seconds. Or something you can also do is check different uh, properties about this date stamp. For instance, days in month or uh, another thing we can check for instance is week. So days in month means that we have uh, a month which has in total 29 days. Interesting, it's uh, 2020 in February and February in 2020 apparently has 29 and not 28 days. Or you can check something like the week, which means it's the eighth week of the year. There are a lot of other operations that you can also check, um, but with this link here, if you're more interested in the specific. Another nice thing about working with timestamps in Pandas is that it makes it really easy to convert between time zones. So you might already be familiar with Unix time. Unix time is the number of seconds elapsed since midnight on the 1st of January of 1970 in the UTC plus zero time zone. And using those number of seconds, for instance, the one that we have here, and we specify that the unit we're using is in fact seconds, we can set the TZ, so the time zone, to a specific time zone name. And that means that if we execute this cell, we see that this Unix time corresponds with 2017, 12, 15, so 15th of December at approximately seven in the evening, specifically for US specific time. Um, of course, if you want to display the exact time, well, you need to provide the time zone. But another thing you can do is convert one time zone to another. In that case, we first have to specify the exact timestamp that we have. That could be, of course, in Unix time, could also be in the format that we saw before. So the year, the month, the day, the time. And then we specify that this is this timestamp is specifically in the US specific time zone. But in this case, we're interested not in this time zone, but in Paris specifically. So we use TC time zone convert with simply the string which indicates the name of the time zone, your parents in this case. And we easily have the same, uh, the same timestamp, but then for the Europe Paris time zone. Another nice thing is that pandas can recognize timestamps in various formats. So often it will try to interpret the format based on what you give it. So in this case, in 2020-03-27, well, this is obviously going to be the year. There's no 27th month. So this is obviously going to be the day. And this is going to be the month. And the same for April 1st, 2020, or the 25-05-2020. We see that each of these dates get converted to the same format, but they are actually what we sort of expect to happen. But because there's this assumption in how, to, um, in how to format it, that doesn't of course always hold. Sometimes you can have uh, dates written in a format that are ambiguous. For instance, I am based in Europe, so I would interpret this as the second day of the first month, which is uh, the 2nd of January, and this is the third day of the first month. But people from the US, which the majority of you are, might interpret it the other way around. So in order to avoid confusion like that, we um, explicitly format the timestamps with the format option. So for instance here, well, this is the way that we wrote down the dates and we specifically format it with month, year and day. This fixed formatting also helps if you want to know if single dates are unexpectedly in the wrong format. Because with fixed formatting, you will get an error raised. Um, instead of that, you rely on Pandas to figure it out. But 
this is all just the background knowledge on how timestamps are handled in PanMath itself. What we're really interested in is if you have a time series data set, what can you do with that time series data set? And for this, throughout this notebook, we'll be using the household power consumption data set from the UCI ML repo. And it contains information about the power consumption uh, time series data for a single household in Paris between 2006 and 2010. Normally, when you're, walk when you're working with PANDAS, you would read in the CSV file like this. You would say, well, we're using PANDAS, we read the CSV and a link to the, or the, the path to the CSV file. And we see that this works for our power consumption data set. We have two columns in total. We have the TS, the time, and we have the corresponding consumption. Here we have an index zero to four, that's pandas, but, and we have the two columns that we're interested in as separate columns. However, we wanna make explicit that what we're working with here, this TS, this shouldn't just contain strings. Of course, it currently contains strings that happen to follow a certain format of a timestamp, but we wanna make explicit that we want to parse it not as a generic string, but as a timestamp specifically. So we make a small adjustment to say that we don't only read in from this path, but we also parse the date, parse the columns that we pass here as dates. So any column that I add here will be parsed as dates and will therefore also raise an error if there happens to be a string that doesn't contain a date. Our output seems the same, but we're being more explicit here. And we can actually see that if we access the TS column and we access the first value, that this is in fact interpreted as a timestamp. However, there's one small other adjustment that we'll usually make if we are reading in data for time series analysis. And that is has to do with setting the date as the index. If we don't set the date as the index, if we would simply plot the information that we have here, takes a little bit of time, we see that we get a plot that's not very interesting. It tries to plot both columns at the same time. It doesn't, yeah, it's it's not a it's not exactly what I was looking for because what I was looking for was specifically. A uh, plot that plotted the consumption against time. But if we make a small adjustment to how we read into data and we specifically say the index column should be the column that is called TS, we notice that as we read in the data, it is displayed a little bit differently. We lose that index that we had first, the zero until four. This has become bold to indicate that this is in fact our index and well, it is displayed a little bit differently to indicate that this is not just a regular column anymore, it is our index. And if we access our index zero, we see that we get the timestamp that we before had when we accessed our column TS, and then specifically the zero value. But this does improve our plot quite a bit because if we now plot it, we will plot the consumption against the index that we have. So we see here that by simply plotting this data frame, we immediately see that on the x-axis, we have January, 2007 until, well, this is about December, 2010, I suppose. And we have the consumption exactly per uh, time step. And it's not only for plotting that we're setting the index. We're also setting the index as our uh, timestamp um, because it allows for easier time-based manipulations. And the first most prominent example of that is what we call easy aggregations with resample. If you're a little bit more familiar with pandas and you use it a little bit more often, you might already be familiar with group by, another type of aggregation. But in this case, resample is specifically uh, neat for time series analysis 
Because for instance, something that you can do and very easily do is use resample to, for instance, calculate the mean for a year. In this case, we refer to power, the data frame that we have. We use resample with Y that indicates the year. And we're interested in our mean. And as we execute this, we see that we now no longer have um, the timestamps for, for day and for time. Uh, we actually just have it per year for the 12th of, uh, for the 31st of December. And we have the mean consumption over those years. So it seems like the mean consumption was a lot higher in 2006 than it was for the other years. But in this case, we chose year. There's also other values that you can choose here. You can, you can run the same aggregations, for instance, per month by changing it to M. And we notice that we get the consumption per month now. We can even do uh, something like quarter. And you see that it goes per three months now or per week. And the nice thing about it is that you can even do this a little bit more uh, specific. For instance, you're interested in the mean hour consumption per three weeks, for instance. And by simply adding the three here to the W to indicate three weeks, a custom time frame that you chose yourself, we see that we have that mean power consumption per three weeks now. There are, so we have the, you can run those aggregations per month, week, day, or quarter. Um, there are actually a lot more offsets that you can use. There's a link here that can be as specific as the business month begin, or uh, you can make custom aggregation periods if you want, for example, per three weeks or per four months. And in the case that your data also concludes times, then you can also aggregate per time unit, for instance, per hour. In this case, we're demonstrating that we can do it per three hours by referring to our data frame using the resample method. We're using it per three hours. And again, then we specify the statistic that we want to calculate over those three hours. So in this case, the mean could be something else entirely. So here we see that we can Per three hours, we get a mean consumption over the previous three hours. And previously, we were just using the mean, but you can even use your own custom calculation. For instance, you could be interested in the spread per month. So what is the lowest and the highest value that, in your, that you had in your month uh, for power consumption? And what is the difference between that? And in that case, Again, we're using following the same format. We're first referring to our data frame. Then we refer to our resample method, and we want to do it per month. But instead of using mean, a built-in uh, calculation, we use apply to define with the lambda function our own calculation, which in this case is subtracting the max consumption with the min consumption. And that should give us the spread per month. In this case, what it's also really useful for is that from this point in notebook onwards, we're actually going to use a daily data frame because we do have that power consumption per hour uh, and even per seconds, but that's just a little bit too little for what we're interested in. So in this case, we're only interested in the daily power consumption and we're going to create a new data frame called power daily which is simply the power data frame resampled by day. And the statistic that we want to calculate over that day is simply the sum. And we see here that as we display the head, we get the power consumption, the sum power consumption per day. That brings us to some other things we can also do with this data frame. And that is also particularly useful, not necessarily now uh, already, but if we're doing more modeling and forecasting, is that we can create time-based features. So we have the times and we have the, the timestamps, but using the assign method, it, is, it makes it really easy to create new features 
based on some of something around the index, in this case, the week of the year. So what we're doing here is we're referring to our Power Daily, our uh, aggregated um, uh, new version of our Power Data frame that we just created. And for each row in the Power Daily, we want to know what week of the year it was. So was it the first week in January, the last week in December? Well, actually you see that this corresponds. The 16th of December was the 50th week. The 18th of December was the 51st week. And of course, besides week of year, there are a lot of other properties and methods such as quarter, um, but again, it's even more detailed than that, that you can also use here to create new features alongside just your consumption. Another really nice thing, and we'll have some bonus information in here, um, uh, that we could have skipped over, but I want to tell you about this anyway, uh, which because I think it's really nice, is uh, shifting. And this is something that I already knew for, from Pandas, but it's particularly useful in time series as well. Because shifting allows you to shift some variables forward or backward in time. And that can help you create variables with lag values, or for instance, calculate differences between time steps. So previously, we created a new column by referring to our data frame and using the assign method. And that's what we're now going to do as well. We're going to refer to our Power Daily data frame and use assign to create a column that we call consumption yesterday. And that was going to hold the consumption that we had the day before. Let me just comment this out real quick. And you'll notice that on the first day of our time series data frame, we in fact don't have a consumption yesterday. That makes sense because there's nothing recorded before this first day that we have here. But from that day onwards, the value that you see here in your consumption yesterday column is the value that is in fact the consumption that we had yesterday. And how did we do that? Well, we created that consumption yesterday column here. We created the name here. And we use a Lambda function, which used the consumption column. So this column over here, and we called it, we had shift one. You can use different, uh, different things than one, of course. You'll see that I can quickly create a different column. Uh, let's call it consumption tomorrow by doing minus one. And you'll notice that it is the other way around now, but that's of course not the one we're interested in at the moment. Um, so this value either minus or plus determines how much of the values are, the values are actually shifted. And the nice thing about this is that because we now have this new column called consumption yesterday, we can create an additional column and that's gonna be called our consumption increase which is simply the current value of consumption minus the value of consumption yesterday. So we see here again, for the first row in our data frame, we don't have that information. There is no consumption of yesterday. So that's not something that we can calculate, but from every data point onwards, we do see that we take the current consumption and the consumption that there was the day before and we actually do see the difference between those two, which can be very nice as well. And that brings us to our last topic of today about time series analysis, which is about rolling and smoothing. So let's create another plot. And in this case, let's create a plot specifically for 2007 to 2008. When I take a look at this plot, what, I, what I'm most interested in as an on viewer is the general trend in the data. And because there are so many details here, there's actually a lot of information in here that I try to kind of filter out myself when I'm looking for the trend, because it seems like the line is going up here and then up down a bit. The general trend is that the consumption is higher around January than around July, but because the plot is so detailed, it is difficult to see what's happening. 
And that's where rolling average smoothing or other types of smoothing come in. So what I can do instead is because we have this, uh, because we have these spikes and this noise, the overall patterns may be hard to see. And in order to see the smoother patterns over time, we can use a rolling average and apply that to the time circle. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my original consumption, which is this very spiky plot. But in addition to that, I'm also going to uh, plot the rolling average over a 20 day period in this time. And I'm going to create that by using this sign, creating a new column that we call rolling mean. I'll actually display that first. We see that the values are a little bit different and then make a plot about this. The blue line is still the consumption, just as we saw before. But now in addition to that, we also see the rolling mean. And this is also why it's really handy that our time series is actually our index because all the other columns are still plotted and the time series is used as the index. And you'll notice that the orange line that we have here shows the patterns of our data a lot more clearly than the spiky blue lines that we had before. The choice that we made here using rolling, we again, just like previously, used a sign to create another column. This other column was called rolling mean. And then with the lambda function, we specified how we wanted to create this. And in this case, we specifically used the rolling method, which can be called both on a data frame as well as a series object. And we set the window size to 20, which means that, um, which is a fixed number of data points for, uh, for time interval, which means that we take the average over the 20 day period for each point. But of course, I can change this value, for instance, to seven. And that means that I expect my plot to be a little bit less smooth because it takes a smaller window and a smaller time frame into account. While for 20 days, our plot's going to be more smooth. It takes 20 days in total into account. And if it would make it 50 days, for instance, it's a really smooth line that doesn't even follow the trend of the data that much anymore. One thing in particular that we notice um, when we specifically use the window of 20 days is that the orange line that we see here is lagging behind what's actually happening a little bit. We, I think we see that most clearly over here and over here, where we have a, a, quite a rapid drop in power consumption. And we do see that drop in the orange line, but we only see that after that 20 days have actually passed. That drop is only happening here and not here where we expect it to happen. And that is because each point demonstrates information about all the previous 20 days and not just about that particular moment. And we can remove that effect by using centering. And we can do centering in two ways. First of all, we simply have an option that is called center that we can use with rolling that will allow you to center. Or we can manually do the centering by using that shifting functionality that we just talked about. Because when you're shifting, you can change the values to uh, the values that were, for instance, 10 days previous. We'll demonstrate both methods here. Uh, we have rolling mean center, where we simply set the center is true. But you'll notice that this has slightly changed. So previously, we were giving it a 20 day uh, frame in interval in a string, and now we're no longer able to pass the string. And we do this manually as well um, by simply referring to the previous column that we just recreated and shifting it. And you'll notice now our plot is starting to get a little bit big. We have four different things that we're plotting here. First of all, the original power consumption, which we still have, the rolling mean, uh, the orange line that we saw previously, where this, the drop only happens around here at almost the end, a little bit late. 
and the rolling mean center and manual center, the green line and the red line. But you actually don't see those because both of those are exactly the same. And you'll notice that this is actually a little bit more neat to, it doesn't lag behind as much anymore as the orange line did. So rolling average tooling is a very simple way to um, isolate the noise and get a general idea about the time series behavior. But it does have some drawbacks. So uh, for instance, small window sizes can lead to more noise than signal. And what we've already seen, it always lags behind the size, the window size, unless we actively choose to center it. Additionally, it's not really informative about the future necessarily. It's just a description or helps you understand what is happening in your data right now. And it can be significantly skewed by extreme data points because it does take this average over, for instance, 20 days or seven days. And if there's one data point that's really outside of the realm of what you expect, that will influence your line or your point. There are a couple of other rolling and smoothing methods. Uh, for instance, exponential smoothing. We won't go into detail about that now, but I do have the information here for you if you are interested. Uh, essentially what you do with exponential smoothing is that you recursively smooth um, with a smoothing factor. And if that smoothing factor is high, um, the smoothing will be low and the average will respond quicker to changes. And if it's low, the result will be more smooth and flat. I can demonstrate that here. So we have two lines here, the orange line with uh, a smaller smoothing, uh, a bigger smoothing factor, and the green line with a lower smoothing factor. Additionally, we also have things like weighted smoothing, where essentially what you're doing is taking data points that are closer to your current data point more into account than the ones that are further apart and expanding windows. Uh, I've put some links here to read more about it, also about how you do this in Panda specifically, and maybe also what the advantages are, if you're interested in that. But unfortunately, we don't have to get time to go into all the different smoothing methods and when to use them exactly. One reason why you might want to use smoothing, for instance, and that could also, also already work with uh, rolling average smoothing, is if you have missing data points in your data, and you want to replace those data points by something that seems like a relatively good approach, like a relatively good well, um, value for your missing data point. In those cases, a rolling average smoothing might be very nice, for instance. All right, so to reiterate, in this uh, notebook so far, we have covered timestamps and how these work in Pandas and also specifically the formatting of timestamps. We discussed how to properly read in time series data in Pandas, not just opening the CSV, but also being explicit about the columns for which you want to parse the date. And because it will throw errors if not all of your values are dates then. And we discussed that it is important to set the date as index and later on showed that, for instance, one of the advantages is that you can use resample, but another advantage is that if you plot various columns, every time the index will be used and you'll have a really neat plot. We covered some time-based manipulations, such as easy aggregations with resample, some time-based features based on the D-type and shifting. And we saw an example of rolling average smoothing to discover the general trends in your data and its disadvantages. And we listed some alternatives, but we didn't have the time to go into that. Based on the information that you have now, you should be able to answer questions about this data set, like during what five day period was the most energy consumed or what 10 day period had the highest decrease in energy consumption between the first and the last day. Or you could answer questions like, does the energy consumption drop in the weekend? Or could we replace those missing values with smoothing? Or even something like, can we detect holiday periods based on the assumption that the average power consumption drops significantly 
for a few days during a holiday period. So can we detect when those holiday periods are? I wanna suggest that it is 10 to the six in my time zone, or 10 to the whole hour in uh, yours. Um, I suggest that we take a 10 minute break now before we continue on with Fadim Spark. For those of you who have questions, feel absolutely free to ask those questions in the chat. We'll also have an opportunity to answer questions later on, but in the break, I'm also happy to answer some questions. Let's continue on the whole hour, so in 10 minutes. Uh, Marisha, I see there's a question in the chat. The question is, are there any guidelines for picking a good window size? Um, Fadim, maybe you can answer a little bit more about this. Are you here? Very good question. Huh? Yes, uh, you just got me before getting some water. Um, I would say that's that's a matter of trial and error. That really depends on what uh, you're trying to achieve with uh, smoothing. So if you're really trying to find the, you know, the clear picture of what happens in the long run, you will naturally experiment with uh, larger windows. If you're trying to um, sort of see what happens within a shorter period of time, like a month or a week, right? So then you would naturally experiment more with those sizes. But um, if, well, all of this really depends on the amount of variation you see uh, within each season, right? So I would say in practice, that's uh, trial and error. Uh, see what you're trying to achieve, play around with different window sizes around that uh, logic, and well, hopefully this will help. And I'll pause the recording until we resume. All right, thank you. I'm happy to pick it up from here, but maybe someone came up with a really good question for Marisha to make your life a little bit more difficult before take it over. If not, uh, I think there'll still be uh, some room for that at the end of my part and also during or after the, uh, well, the exercise session. All right, let me start sharing and Let's talk about what we're going to do next. Uh, maybe a few words, a few more words about myself. Um, so as I said, my name is Vadim. I'm a colleague of Marisha. I work quite a lot, uh, both as a trainer and a consultant and the time series being one of my favorite type of data to work with. So very happy to be here today. And uh, my background is actually in uh, econometrics, which is naturally heavily reliant on a lot of time series, so, but different kinds of time series. Um, so we'll see how that all helps us today. Right. Okay, if things work correctly, you should be seeing my screen with the second notebook open, which you should be also able to access yourself. And this one is called seasonality modeling. Um, now we're making a pretty important step here because pretty much what we've done in the past hour is some of the core skills to do a very broad range of things with uh, time series. Uh, but that mostly means analyzing what you have, restructuring it, resampling things, you know, to getting your data ready for something different, something that would come next. And this moment has actually come because we're going to talk about actually modeling uh, time series. And this will also bring us towards forecasting, which is one of the main purposes of, well, doing pretty much anything with time series data. Uh, we'll try to cover a range of um, topics that you can see here on this list. Uh, some of them will uh, remain more bonus topics, but um, we'll see depending on the pace. Uh, feel totally free to interrupt me with questions. Um, some of the stuff in my part will be a little bit more complicated, especially for those who might be lacking some background in, um, well, some basic machine learning, or perhaps um, do have a couple of extra plots here and there. Um, and also for general Python questions, I think we should have enough time to answer some of those, but let's see how that goes. Uh, most importantly, we'll talk about, well, how to actually look at a time series, how to um, understand what it consists of, why is it important, why and how we would be able to break it down into those components, uh, what are sort of the possible approaches to model this, 
and how to choose the right one, how to evaluate what you've done and make use of it. And we'll learn a couple of tips and tricks along the way that should hopefully be useful to everyone. Of course, that's no easy task, right? Because you might be thinking, yeah, time series analysis is probably some hardcore neural networks involved. Some people do that, but we'll actually try to find a nice balance in between. So if you never did something like this before, uh, but maybe you know some basics of scikit-learn and uh, uh, regressions that will tremendously help you. Or if you're very comfortable with all of this, I hope there's still gonna be quite a bit of um, things to learn and pick up that will hopefully make your life easier in the future with this type of problems. Uh, this set, unless there are questions and please interrupt me if there are such, I think we're ready to begin. And to make our life a little bit more interesting, uh, here we'll actually focus on one very practical problem. And this data set actually comes from the US, which should be extra relevant uh, in the session. And uh, we've made a bit of a, a, well, smaller squeeze of the problem. The, you can access the original data set here with the link uh, to Kegel. Uh, essentially that data set con uh, consists information about air quality in the US, but we got a, a sample of that specifically for California to make it a bit more traceable. And also you'll see that things are a little bit more interesting there. Uh, and essentially we'll look at air quality index from 2007 to 2017. Let me maybe drop it in already. And we'll see quite a few interesting things there. Uh, maybe one important thing just to keep in mind for your general intuition, if you see the value being high means air quality is low. If you see it down means the air quality is actually good. So that's a bit counterintuitive. Um, that said, I'll try to keep track of any new pandas and other related things popping up. I think most of the things, at least in the beginning, should be familiar, uh, but if not, please let me know. All right, so let's get this data set and start a conversation about, well, what it consists of and what are we going to do with it. Uh, first, let's have a look together, and of course, as much as I would like to ask every single one of you of your opinion about it, perhaps for the time's sake, just look at it yourself and give it a bit of a thought. What do you see here? So what do we see over the time, over the span of this 10 years that might really you know, look peculiar to your eye? And above you see the whole span of 10 years and on the graph below you see a zoom in into one particular year. Just think about it. I see a bunch of... Uh, Right, um, people mentioning things like peaks, trend, and all these other things. But if you have this intuition, uh, that's definitely the kind of things we'll talk about. So one thing that definitely should be quite naturally visible here, right, is fluctuations, and they definitely look not random, right? Something's going on here, and you can see that this goes in line with uh, yearly progression. And in fact, you can see that the peaks, right, the tops are coinciding with the beginnings of the year, so probably the winter and the lows are coinciding with the summers. Now, we're not actually going to go into theory of you know, how energy consumption and all that contributes to air pollution. We'll be a little bit more interested in just the data as a whole, right? So trying to uh, decompose it and uh, bring some meaning out of it. But one thing is clear, right? So there is some fluctuations related to the uh, yearly repetitions, something we'll refer to as seasons, but more on that later. And yeah, there is some trend here, right? It's well, kind of downwards, maybe a little bit flat at the end, right? But we do see some downward trend, which kind of means that the air quality was moderately improving, right? And maybe flattening at the last several years. Um, all right, so generally to summarize it, we, we might not see all of this clearly here, by the way, but and also opinions are often different on that. But typically we'll see the following components in pretty much any time series provided you have enough granularity of your data and enough uh, years to look at. Uh, well, typically you'll see some sort of trend and uh, actually if nothing is happening, if things are stagnant, that's also a type of a trend, right? We'll just call it horizontal trend or uh, flat trend. Um, otherwise we'll typically observe an upward trend or downward trend or all kinds of different shapes of it, but that's essentially how are things looking on average, which way they're going. That should be quite intuitive. The interesting part that we'll talk quite a lot about in this session is seasonality. 
And I'll immediately mention the third part because those two are often confused. Um, this one usually has different names, but uh, I refer to it here as cyclical components. But that's essentially anything that does occur every now and then, but without any set repetitions. So the best example for that would be something like random shock. So think about uh, things like crisis or bubbles, you know, things that do happen and we know that they happen when they happen, right? Think of the 2008, 2009 crisis, things like that. But it's not like, yeah, every Friday, every eight years, here's a crisis coming, right? If, if only that was that simple. Um, seasonality on the other hand is a lot more tractable, right? So we, in fact, here we can, even without fitting any models, we can figure out, okay, well, if it's winter, the air quality is probably going to be worse than in the summer. All right. Uh, finally, there's also one more technical component that we should mention here, and that is residuals, right? And as the name suggests, it's pretty much everything else that we cannot otherwise contribute to any of the other explanations. Sometimes it's just noise, you know, or some other random factors that we cannot otherwise model. All right, so the question is uh, how we should deal with all of that. And well, maybe first of all, why should we even bother? Um, and in fact, there could be quite a few reasons to, well, put some thought and some action into this problem. Well, first of all, as Marisha already mentioned in the past uh, half of our session, uh, we might actually be interested in getting closer to the actual signal, right? Signal being essentially what's going on in a nutshell in this problem. And if you don't care so much about this, you know, predictable seasonal fluctuations, you might be actually caring about, okay, is the government policy helping improve air quality, right? And things like that. Or does the uh, change in air quality indicate that we are moving towards our green targets? Things like that, right? Um, so in this case, we might want to get away, not just from the noise, but also from the seasonal fluctuations. Uh, also, we might actually want to look into them with more attention and try to figure out, well, why do they happen? Which peaks and drops are proportionally larger, right? Is there any sort of explanation to what's happening? Um, there's a bunch of other reasons you see here, right? And then it depends on your particular application. But I can tell you straight away that this days, right? Unlike, um, I should mention, sort of traditional time series modeling theories back from 70s and 80s, when time series data was typically stuff like stock markets, uh, which is you know highly volatile and just changes day to day very rapidly. Uh, these days, data scientists and the likes of it typically work with business data, right? And this is usually much more predictable and is subject to much more seasonal fluctuations. So that's why it should be naturally much, much more relevant for all of us. Um, so what we'll talk about is to, well, first of all, how to understand it, how to maybe model it, maybe get rid of it, and how to see the bigger picture. And the first little suggestion that you, you should already be able to sort of go, um, go with and perhaps think whether that helps is, well, if we're trying to understand what happens uh, behind the hood, right? So living seasonality aside, why don't we just smooth the whole thing and well, look at the resulting curve. And in fact, what I did here is a very large uh, rolling window, right? So a whole year with some centering to keep things a bit at the right place. And arguably, it kind of looks like a trend here, right? So you could argue that, yeah, well, that could be a, one way to just, you know, simplify the problem, look at the dynamics and forget about the seasonality. Now, as you'll see later, that unfortunately, that's not as simple as that because we'll typically want, you know, something more mathematically traceable than just some kind of a smooth, unpredictable curve the way you see here, but well, that's a way to start. In fact, if you like this approach, you can take it even further uh, because if you have this curve, you can actually uh, get access to your seasonality by subtracting the two. And that's exactly what you can see happening in my next bits, right? So um, you'll see quite a bit of pandas code here and there, by the way, so I, I'm happy to elaborate a bit more, but essentially what's happening here, we're creating a uh, rolling value right for this large window then we're subtracting it from the actual air quality to get the actual seasonality and then well you'll see that let me first drop the whole thing you'll see that essentially we get something like those blue values here which are still highly well volatile right with a lot of small fluctuations here and there we actually want to see the smoother picture than that but again we just learned about rolling 
And that means we can actually also smooth that. So in this case, I'm actually also applying a window of 90 days to smooth that resulting series. And I'll probably end up with something like this. Now that does kind of look like yearly seasonal fluctuations, but think about it for a second. Are we happy with this? Can we just, you know, say we just figured out seasonality. We know what happens in summers, winters, falls and all that and call it a day or other potential issues with it. You don't have to answer per se, just think for yourself. All right, well, I, I think the question is a bit suggestive in this case. Well, don't get me wrong, this is actually still useful, right? If you just want to really quickly get to the essence of, okay, what happens uh, within each year, how could seasonality look like? This is relatively uh, informative of that, but there are several problems with it, right? So first of all, this is no mathematical equation, even though that might look like some kind of sine curve and you can even try to fit some sort of sine curve over that. Uh, we're not quite yet there, right? So if we want to mathematically forecast what happens next, that's actually close to impossible. Um, and worse than that, right, um, we did some centering. So um, um, I'm not sure Marisha mentioned in the uh, greatest detail uh, why centering is a problem for forecasting, but as we're using some values from the future to produce um, essentially the values now, um, that just doesn't go together. So. Uh, long story short, keep in mind, right, that this approach might be useful to get some information really quickly. But if you want to do anything about things like forecasting or mathematically quantifying what happens in different seasons, that's just really not the way to go. That just sort of sneak peek into the problem and not more than that. Uh, we'll actually want to do something much more, well, mathematically traceable than that. And that's what we'll do in the remainder of the session. All right. Since I'm not being stopped, um, let me see if there are any questions popping up. All right. Um, so the approach I'm actually going to take in this session um, should, well, at first maybe appear surprisingly simple, but later I hope everyone, even those that are, you know, more fans of much more complicated black box models, will actually also appreciate the, well, beauty in its simplicity. Uh, what we're actually going to do here is start very simple and then build up on top of that and see how we improve things. And we'll start with a linear regression, something that hopefully most of you at least are a little bit familiar with. And um, of course, in Python, there are different ways to get that into the equation. And we'll be using the scikit-learn approach, which is probably the most popular way to fit anything related to machine learning. And yes, I know that people disagree, but arguably linear regression is a type of machine learning. So what we'll try to do here is essentially convert this problem to something we can work with for modeling. And uh, well, just like with any other modeling problem, we'll need our components, right? So in this case, we'll start very simple. We'll just need the X in our case, simply being the time, right? So each, every single day or every single month, depending on the granularity of this uh, data um, and what we're trying to trace, right? So the time series itself, and that's the values of the air quality index. There we go. And just again, in case we want to quickly have a look, that's our X, right? So simply the uh, indices assigned to each particular timestamp. And our Y is essentially just the values of that air quality index starting from the very first timestamp. So the first simple step we do is well, I actually got this somewhere above here already from scikit-learn and I'm just going to fit linear regression. And again, if you're familiar, that should look very simple. If you're not familiar with scikit-learn, it should still not be too complicated because essentially all we do is we, uh, well, create this model over here and we fit it over the X being the time and Y being the time series that we're interested in. And I'm going to create a new variable and plug it into our original data set and call it linear trend. And the way it's acquired is that once the model is trained, right, so simply the linear equation is found, I'm going to ask it to predict, so basically draw a, a best fit line over the set of X. Let's see how this looks. Voila, basically we found the best linear regression to go through the uh, time series over here. 
And you can see that it actually goes quite similar to this smooth value with an important difference. Well, it does have some flaws. We'll get to it in a sec. But mathematically speaking, now this is very well defined, right? So it's basically nails down to a single intercept and a single coefficient for the time variable. So that means technically speaking, we can both roll it back into the past and we can roll it into the future and also predict for any amount of years what is the value going to be according to the simple linear model. Now, if you're still with me, that means we're on a good page because things will get more complicated from here. Please interrupt me if I'm too quick on some of this uh, specificities, but all right. Um, of course, there are a couple of problems with it, right? So even just talking about the trend itself, if you thought about it, probably one of the most obvious ones being, right, that we discussed this flattening at the end. Of course, a single line will be heavily affected by whatever happened here in the several past years where the trend was actually decreasing. Um, and it doesn't quite capture this flattening. And in fact, we didn't give our model enough flexibility to do that. Now, we can quite easily fix that. And um, well, in regression problems, uh, as many of you might be familiar, um, simple approach would be just to add a trend break, well, or in this case, an interaction term in our regression model. And well, there are better ways to do that. If you want to do something more complicated, you can you know, propose different options, test them, and all that. For now, we'll keep things simple and we'll simply say, okay, it looks like in the summer of 2014 is where the flattening began. And we're going to introduce basically a dummy variable that is zero beforehand and afterwards it is equal to one. Introduce it into our model alongside uh, with the time variable and also add an interaction term. I can show you later why interaction term is important, but basically this will affect whether there's like a nice break of the trend or a jump or a parallel continuation or not. So let's see that in a little bit. Um, essentially what I'm doing here is creating this dummy over here, which is maybe a little bit more complicated than it could be. It could be a couple of simpler ways to do that, but essentially creating it to be equal to one above this timestamp and zero otherwise, so before that. And then simply adding an interaction term for before and after. So let's have a look at the result. And then we'll discuss well why the interaction term was important and maybe I, think I have a question. So when, yes, when what is the purpose of the interaction? So you're you're picking 2014 June uh, arbitrarily as as a point of interest. Mm -hmm. And then so what does the interaction component do? All right. Well, the best way I can answer this question is by just letting everyone see what difference it makes. So let's first see how it looks like with interaction. Right, so you see the declining trend and then uh, essentially, hey, I think it's a bit hard to see here, right? But there's a little, I'm not actually sure whether there's an actual jump, but anyways, let's just assume that it just breaks the line and continues flat. And now for the sake of the exercise, let's quickly cancel all that. Oh, let me see if, I think that should be enough. Yep. So what happens when I remove the interaction term and I only kept the dummy, mathematically speaking, it basically says that there will be a flat extra effect starting from 2014. And all that it can do to my model is bring it a bit upwards or downwards, right? And maybe keep it the same if it's close to zero. So what this model indicates is that, yeah, the, the trend should change in that year, but it cannot do more than just move it upwards, but it cannot basically change the slope itself. Right. While my whole problem with it was that I expected the slope to be negative in the beginning and I want it to be close to zero later. Right. And the way I can achieve it is actually by adding interaction term because interaction term will mean that the dummy variable itself now actually has an additional effect on the slope coefficient as well. Now I could have written it down for you in terms of the mathematical equation. It's not too complicated, but uh, for the sake of time, I suggest to um, skip that. You can try that yourself with, you know, the intercept plus coefficient times time plus coefficient times dummy plus coefficient times the interaction and you know gather things together to see where this comes from or otherwise maybe if we have time uh, during the exercise session help I'm happy to explain that as well but for now I hope that illustrates my point so there we go yes thank you we have, a, we have a trend break and the slope has changed to something close to zero 
All right. So, well, we actually acquired a well-defined, mathematically well-defined trend curve here, right? That actually captures pretty well what happens over the long time, despite its arguable simplicity. So we observe a declining trend up until summer 2014, and it flattens off to that. Um, well, we didn't quite really achieve what we might have wanted initially though, right? Because for now we basically just ignored whatever the seasons were and we just wanted to see the average picture with the trend. Well, trend being an important component is now defined with a simple model, but we might want to make things more complicated. Think for a second, why do we, why do we might want to actually get to this fluctuations? I don't need an answer, but again, it's good to think for yourself for a bit. Well, specifically, right, if you want to forecast with a simple model um, and you want to forecast better than just some average in that year, right, if you want to forecast, okay, is there going to be a, something bad happening next summer, right, then I actually want to know what should I expect specifically in that season. Uh, but luckily, with a bit of what we call feature engineering, we can actually quite easily achieve that as well. And um, further on, we'll try to do it in a pretty straightforward way by adding, well, you guessed it, more dummy variables. Uh, but if time allows, I will also show you some more sophisticated tricks um, to achieve the same thing. Now things will get a little bit more complicated in terms of usage of scikit-learn. So if you haven't really dealt with a library much in the past, uh, be aware that some things might be a bit more unclear. Uh, but in general, uh, things can also be done um, a little bit simpler. So I'm happy to clarify. Um, so what we're going to do is to add the well seasonal component to this model. Uh, the way we're going to do this is as follows. Well, first of all, I want to keep track of which month we're in. Remember, the nice thing about time series, right? Time actually contains a lot of information. And the interesting thing is that even though, well, before my X variable was just, you know, from zero up until the last day measured one day at a time, I can actually know because this is time and those are years and there's some repetition the way you know our human world works probably there's similarity between say december 2012 and december 2013 but i need to let my model know that the way i can achieve that is by adding a month variable to the uh, problem and as marisha has shown right pandas luckily has a few convenient ways of acquiring that so i can essentially acquire which month a particular timestamp is by simply uh, doing the following, right? So picking up the month attribute of the index containing all of the timestamps. Um, now I have to go a bit ahead, um, I'm going to explain it at the end of the session, but, uh, some intuition already now, because eventually, as I mentioned, one of our final goals might be that we want to forecast what happens in the future. Well, here we don't have any real future in this data set yet. What we'll do is, um, well, the simplest possible train test split for time series. We can have a little discussion of why is it different for time series than for other problems. But what should be natural here is that essentially I'm picking up the last two years, separating them as the test set or the imaginary future and keeping everything else as the train set, so the past. And I hope most of you, even if you never dealt with it, understand why I cannot just pick random points throughout time and assign them to train and test, right? Because I cannot use any data from 2016 to forecast in the past what happened in 2009, right? That's just not how it works. There's a very concrete dependency in time series. So the past has to always translate into the future, not the other way around. All right, so for the sake of what we'll do um, in the end of the session, I'll already do that. So essentially, draw a line and throw away some of this to only inspect later when we do some forecasting. Uh, for now, I'm collecting this data set here as air data frame train, air data set test. And uh, the way to do this in Pandas is actually really simple. You can just use the lock method, which allows logical selections, and you can slice based on, uh, well, actual timestamp. So you can say, I want everything up until April, 2015. And the other one is everything starting from that point. All right, um, here's just a little illustration of what happened. So back to what we were trying to do, right? Remember, we're trying to add the information about which month of the year we're actually in at each particular moment in time. I should have mentioned that the data set has monthly granularity, so we cannot know deeper than a single month. 
And um, up until now, essentially every, well, let me quickly drop it here so that you know how it looks like. We have a bunch of variables from the past when we were predicting things. And now we have this extra month variable basically saying which month we're in. Right, so just to give a better idea is a sample method that will give me some random observations. Right, so we get different indications from one to uh, 12, if I'm correct, for each month. Um, now, I'll essentially collect only time and month out of this data set into my X set of features. And of course, I'll still keep the um, air quality as my only uh, variable I'm trying to predict. So basically, what I'm trying to do now is not only use the time to construct some kind of trend, I want to incorporate this information about which month we're in to allow my linear model to also make forecasts based on which month it is, right? So hopefully it will pick up that uh, summers uh, have better air than winters. Um, now, there are different ways to do that. And if you're familiar with pandas, you might've heard of the name called um, get dummies, method called get dummies, which would essentially do the same thing. Basically, we want for each month, a new indicator variable saying, is it zero or is it one? And essentially then depending on that, this dummy variable will indicate which month we're in and which month we're not in. Um, I'll do it a little bit differently. And this might be a bit more new to you if you didn't work with scikit-learn, but essentially I'll use uh, something called one hot encoder. It's a transformer from scikit-learn, which will pretty much do the same thing. Basically what I will tell it to do is, well, with the help of another transformer. So this is where things get a little bit more complicated, but in a nutshell, without puzzling new people too much, essentially I'm telling uh, scikit-learn here, okay, I want this transformer to pick up a specific variable called month, uh, put it into this transformer called one hot encoder to get dummy variables and drop one of them. Um, now I can spend some time explaining why we always need one less dummy variable than we have categories, but think about it in the following way. If we have three categories, A, B, C, we only need two dummy variables to explain which category it is. If it's A equal to one, then it's A. If it's B equal to one, then it's B. And if both of them are equal to zero, it has to be C, right? So we don't need an extra variable explaining whether it's C or not. Um, if that's too new to you or a little bit too quick, just remember it's a good idea to drop one of your dummy variables when you generate them. All right. Um, so again, what this component will do is we'll transform this monthly feature variable into 11 dummy variables indicating whether it's one of each month. And if none of them are equal to one, then it's the last remaining month. All right. And then in order to combine the building block in scikit-learn with our model, something that is probably one of the most popular and powerful tools in scikit-learn is a machine learning pipeline. Well, this one is relatively simple compared to what you can actually do, but basically we um, send our data into some kind of little data factory. The first step of it is this feature transformer that will generate the dummy variables. And then this will be passed to the linear regression that will actually essentially fit the model over all of these features. And we'll have the time plus 11 monthly dummies, which I'll illustrate in a bit. So hopefully we'll be a little bit more clear, but if you worked with this before, this should look pretty straightforward. All right. Uh, once you've created that, and of course, if it's really new to you, feel free to later play around with this, ask me more questions. Uh, but again, um, you could have also just used pandas to get the dummies and pass them to linear regression like we did before. Uh, here's sort of a more elegant way to do that in scikit-learn. So we're going to use those 12 variables now as the input x monthly and use y train to train this new um, monthly linear model that will take this into account. So there's a question popping up. Okay, that's from Marish, perfect. Um, and let me run this already. And that's what we get. Now we need a few clarifications here. So first of all, maybe let me show you um, now, yeah, the problem with scikit-learn is I wouldn't be really able to access the resulting dummies that easily, only the coefficients, but essentially for this, trust my word, it did create 11 features and you can see them with, uh, well, exactly appropriate monthly jumps everywhere. 
Another thing that you might see is I'm going to print the R square. If you've never seen it before, long story short, it's essentially a very popular metric for continuous problems to, that essentially illustrates to us the percentage of the uh, explained variation in the dependent variable. So again, the closer this is to one, the more actual fluctuations we have managed to explain with, with our model. We're not really trying to reach one here. This will be more useful to compare our model with other similar alternatives that might do the same thing. So to wrap up this little block, and this is pretty important, right? So what we did, we're still doing the same thing. We're doing a linear regression that uses time as one of the core variables. What we added to it is information about which time of the year or which month of the year each of the timestamps belongs to. That was converted to a uh, dummy variable using this one hot encoder of scikit-learn. So we got 12 features to work with. And this linear regression, uh, regression when trained results in this red line over here. That is now, well, you can kind of suspect, right, that there's some kind of underlying trend. So there's still the same line that we've seen in our very first model today. Uh, but now we're actually able to predict exactly what happens every winter, every summer, and every other month. Now you can still say, well, we actually did lose the trend break. We can fix that, but I'm not going to bother with this right now. But we actually solved the problem of not being able so far to say what happens in each season. Now we actually are. So all that was required is provide the information about the particular month to the model by constructing a subsequent dummy variable. Okay, let's look at it for a bit and make sure everyone understands what we just did because that's pretty important. All right, and if that was clear, well, here's one of the most uh, interesting tricks that we'll learn today in the session. Uh, in fact, I suspect that there were some people for whom this is quite straightforward, right? So you might be so far not that uh, engaged. So let's try to make you a bit more engaged, but this is also very useful for everybody else is how do we actually break down this model into all of this relevant components? And this is the huge advantage of this uh, traceable mathematical modeling, right? Is that we can recover every single piece of the model starting from the trend to seasonality, to residuals, everything else, and well, essentially mathematically define them, plot them and do whatever we want with them. So what I want to do now is I want to extract the trend from this model and I want to extract um, seasonality that exists on top of that trend, well, and then the resulting residuals as well. So how can I actually do this? Let's ignore this guy over here for a little bit because that's the complicated bits. Essentially what I'm going to do here is from this model that I've just created, well, I'll just rename things a little bit to make it a bit more mathematically standard. So we'll have the real values and the hat, the predicted values. Um, the easiest bits, of course, is always residuals, because by definition, that's just the difference between the reality and the prediction. So this we can always quite easily calculate. Um, now we have two other components which are a little bit more tricky, and arguably trend is a little bit easier to recover from this model. Essentially what I will need to do, um, and again, let maybe draw this here real quick. So essentially I have here my Y hat prediction being made like uh, let's say we have alpha zero being the intercept, right? Plus beta one for the, well, let's just call it beta zero for the time, right? And then we have the other betas for every single uh, dummy variable, right? So let's call this beta one for dummy uh, January. And this is zero or one. So in order to recover trend, I actually only need, well, there's more months here. I actually need the intercept. I need this whole thing, right? Because this basically defines the trend, but I will also need a little bit from this dummy effects and we'll talk about it why, but hopefully it's clear why these two components define the trend. Okay, I see some questions popping up. Okay. Uh, let's get back to it when we're done with this part. Um, so what I'm doing here is exactly that. So I'm picking up, and this is kind of a uh, perks of using scikit-learn. I can basically use the train model here and pick up the intercept using the intercept attribute. Uh, similarly, I can pick up the coefficient. Well, here I'm using a bit of knowledge because I know which one of this is actually the one correspondent to the trend. If you didn't know, you can do some 
uh, inspection or otherwise just map the names into the coefficients. Um, so that's a bit of annoying part, but in this case, trust my word, this is the coefficient for the time. And here I'm just picking up the, uh, well, essentially the time itself. And finally, I will also need what I call here average seasonal effect, but uh, we'll get back to it. A long story short will be, is that I want the trend to be in the middle of all seasons rather than um, where all of the dummies are equal to zero. But for now, just let's leave that aside for now. And once I've recovered the trend, I can actually quite easily recover the seasonal component because that is defined as the difference between the prediction and the trend, right? Because the prediction is the trend plus the seasonality on top of that. That's how we just defined the last model. Um, so let's first quickly see what comes out of it and then we'll inspect it in greater detail, answer more questions and such things. So what comes out of it is the following. Well, the top graph is just everything combined. You see that the green trend is actually the trend that the model generates, which is identical to the trend we've seen before. So that is a straight line declining through the middle of everything else. Um, the orange ones is the actual full model. And from that, we can actually subtract the seasonality itself. And what this means, this purple graph here is essentially a, well, mathematical representation of by how much the air quality will improve or decrease depending on which month we're in. And this is actually quite useful, right? If you're doing any kind of analysis of the past or you want to accommodate this in your future forecasts, we can actually learn, right, that in the winter, the, uh, well, compared to whatever is the zero here, right? So the average over time, right, the air quality uh, gets worse, well, by this factor, right, which is approximately two times the amount by which it uh, improves in the summer, which is already kind of interesting. And notice that these are all the same over all of the years. Think about why that should actually totally make sense, right? Because we assumed the same effect of every single month, regardless of where we are in the time, right? So the effect of December in 2008 is assumed to be the same as the effect of December in 2015. Well, maybe not the greatest assumption, but uh, for this model, that's what it does. And residuals, well, everything else that we didn't manage to explain with our model, you can see that doesn't quite look like white noise, right? So in the sense, maybe our model is a bit too simple to explain everything, but that's a different story, right? So in this case, residuals are actually quite useful to say, did our model pick up everything that there was to pick up? If it's not, right, we can try to improve it further on, but for now, this will be it. Uh, okay, now one thing that I can already anticipate some people might have missed because I um, intentionally kind of skipped that, that is this average season effect. And I think the best way to show why is that important, let me just set it to zero and let's see what we get. And we see that now actually the trend goes through the very top here. Now, I don't know which month exactly it is, I reckon this is January. Because remember, we dropped the first dummy and the first dummy was January. So if you don't add the average seasonal effect, the trend will naturally pass through the month where all of the dummies are equal to zero. It's kind of a bit back mathematically, but this is exactly what is defined in this equation. Now, since we don't want that, we want to bring the trend in the middle of all seasons rather than to be in January. Uh, this is why here I actually calculate uh, essentially the product of every single coefficient for each dummy times, well, the correspondent, uh, well, fraction that this month takes in a year. So a bit of a technicality, but yet important to know. So, see if there's some... Um, yeah, so good question. Why did we then drop the first dummy? Um, quick answer, right? So if we didn't drop the first dummy, we actually wouldn't have this problem. So this is true. Um, uh, the problem that would happen if we would keep it is a bit more mathematical, right? So you might know from uh, regression analysis that there are things like multicollinearity and the other bits, right? We just, the um, resulting regression is not well defined. There are all kinds of other statistical problems with it. It doesn't always cause a problem. So I know sometimes people are actually fine with adding everything. Um, but again, you know, it's like washing your hands. It's better to um, uh, do that little thing that solves the problem. Yes, it does create some extra things, right? Just like washing your hands is a bit extra tedious sometimes. But that one time when it breaks the whole model and makes some other analysis impossible, uh, that's actually a useful thing to do. But you're right. If we would have kept the dummy for January, 
uh, we wouldn't have to do this walk around. All right. Now we are almost there with the main part that we were trying to do here. So a reminder where we are right now, we just managed to use some monthly dummies to make this model already a lot better, not just the trend, but also what happens every month. And we discussed this little trick, which, uh, well, in this case, I call uh, error trend seasonality decomposition to actually decompose this model into all of this elements, right? The trend, seasons, and everything left, the residuals. Why was that important? What we already discussed, right? Getting the trend from this is informative itself. So is the seasons. We can quantify a lot of things. We can analyze what happens in the past. We can also forecast from this trend, right? Just like we can forecast the seasons alone. Uh, but one little additional perk is that um, some models actually require you to remove seasonality from uh, the equation. So I've actually seen this approach used as a sort of introductory step to other more complex models that require the time series to be completely stripped of any seasonality. So you can do that by simply removing the seasonal component from the real values. Or you can also do something called detrending, and that is essentially removing the trend from the real data. This is how it would look like. All right. And the last but not the least, a couple of extra little, well, things will get more complicated beyond this. So I just wanted to mention this briefly, lift some bonus topics as bonus topics, because of course this goes a little bit beyond what we just discussed. Uh, but I should mention that dummy variables is not always an ideal approach, right? So as this suggests, the effects are quite bumpy, right? So it assumes that the moment it switches from 31st to 1st is an immediate jump, which is not very realistic. You can actually walk around this with a few tricks. Now, I'm not going to get into the detailed math of that, but essentially, if you want to dig through this, this code and this text explains it in quite some detail. But essentially, you can also create effects that look like little triangles, right? That increase once you get closer to the date of interest, like the middle of a month or beginning of a month, and decrease afterwards and R0 elsewhere. There's a simple mathematical equation that can define that. So uh, as an alternative, um, and I'm going to skip the logic in this code for the sake of time, but if you go through it, trust my word, it should be pretty straightforward compared to what we've just done. You'll actually be able to, well, this is how it looks for every single month over the year, but you'll actually be able to skip the problem with uh, bumps. Let's see where the model co comes around. There we go. So if you actually replace dummies with this triangular effects, you will get a model that is a lot more smooth and the monthly effects are a lot more continuous in this case. Now again, not getting this into details, kind of being a bit of a spoiler for what kind of more advanced things you can do with this um, linear modeling approach. Okay, and if there are no, no key questions on that, I'll mention immediately, right? So if you find that interesting, I definitely recommend reading through this chapter and seeing how you can well, do this a little bit more interestingly. There's even more complicated bits like um, instead of triangular functions doing something like a normal distribution, but that's the beauty of linear modeling, right? You can essentially make your features be whatever you like from as simple as dummy variables to as complicated as this. And this will help you model, well, sometimes a lot, sometimes not so much. And the last thing I wanted to do is to actually, well, see why we did all that. How does this contribute to our forecasting? There's some other bonus topics that um, will remain as such. I'll mention it at the end when we talk about what's next. The last thing I wanted to show is, uh, oh, sorry, I have to run, I do have to run the rest real quick. we go. So the last thing that I have here is a bit of a summary. And of course, uh, well, I included one of the bonuses here, which is the prediction made by a sine curve fit on the data. It's a bit of an overkill, right? But if you really find this an interesting topic, you can read into it. But uh, two different models, right? The orange one that we spend most time with, the one based on dummy variables, slightly different one with the triangular effects being the red one, right? Being a bit more smooth over here. 
And this is what the model would say would happen in those two last years, which we have removed from the training data and kept it as the test set, right? So actually the models didn't have access to this data and we see how this models extrapolate two years in the future. And we see, well, that actually isn't all that bad, right? Maybe they're a little bit better for predicting what happens in the winters than what happens in the summers. And maybe the summer was a particularly nasty one with um, forest fires and all that. Uh, but well, we can see that this model has already proven to be more useful than we've seen so far, right? So unlike this moving, we are actually able to extrapolate this in the future, get some values and use this as a forecast. And of course, if you're familiar with, uh, well, metrics for regression models, you can also do things like mean absolute percentage error, uh, you know, all the, um, well, the other metrics applicable in this case and compare this model, select the best one and we'll use it for any further forecasting. All right, I think that's a good moment to sort of uh, leave it there. If there are some core questions about what we've done, right, and we've done this core part about modeling with uh, trend and dummy variables and seasonal decomposition, quite a few extra bonus topics that I usually like to leave for people that you know are quite comfortable with all this but want to know a bit more. And you'll get a chance to practice with all that in the uh, um, exercise session that will be, I believe, in a bit more than 10 minutes, but we still have a couple of minutes for any interesting questions in case someone has any. A lot of information in one day, but... Uh, all right, well, feel free to think about it. And uh, um, I, th uh, I don't know what the plan is, but I think we'll drop into some of the breakout rooms, right? To check on you guys. So if you have some particular questions to us, should be an opportunity to address those. So since we're doing breakout rooms, I'll be pausing the recording and I'll be creating breakout rooms. Each breakout room will have about uh, between two to three people. And the this is a chance for you to get uh, hands-on experience with the topics that have been shared. So you'll see a pop-up in a bit. And so please accept if you're interested in having a hands-on experience and our two tutorial leaders will jump in and help between the different rooms. So, uh, which is called 03 Hackathon. And the idea here is that we have a hackathon and we have a couple of imports here. Please pay attention that you comment out two of those, otherwise they won't work probably. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, these are just to help you. And what we have here are two example data sets, one about cheese production in the Netherlands, because obviously Fadim and I currently reside in the Netherlands, so it seemed appropriate. And one about road accidents in the United Kingdom. And the third option is to use your own data set. If you have a time series data set that you want to, you know, kind of analyze, maybe model around a little bit with the things that we talked about today, you're absolutely free to do so. The assignment here is that you get the time, we get about 20 minutes where we can analyze this data set. And we really encourage you to think of your own research questions that you might want to answer. But if that is too much trouble, and I really do encourage you to think of those first, we do also have some questions that you might want to answer. Some preliminary, easier questions, some more related to data analysis, such as which month on average do the values change the most, and some related to modeling, so more what Fadim talked about. You will be split into breakout rooms of approximately two to three people. And I encourage you to, that one person shares their screen and the others, well, you just um, do this assignment together. So it's not that you have to do it all on your own, but you do it together. Maybe that can help as well. But Ima and I will jump around in the breakout rooms and we'll be there both to help you out with the assignment and to answer any questions you might still have about the material that we just covered. All right, that's it from my part. And before I send people to the rooms, I would also like to offer uh, closed captioning if any of the participants would like support with closed captioning within the room, uh, please let me know in the chat. You can send me a direct message if you don't wish to identify yourself to everyone. And I can ask our captioner to, to, uh, to follow you into the room. I'll assign them to that room and then they can support you with any closed captioning means during the breakout session. Uh, so if you need that support, please let me know in the chat. You can send me a direct message and I'll be happy to assign you. And I'll pause.
pause the recording and we'll see you all in the room in a bit. Right. Shall I take them in for that? So yeah, hopefully everyone managed to do at least a little bit. And of course, uh, we only have that much time for, well, I know everyone would like to have more fun with all of this. Well, the good news is that all of that, uh, all of those links are still with you. So you can keep playing around with that beyond the session for as much as you like. Um, and let's see, maybe we'll uh, later drop in the chat some contact information of how you can reach to us if uh, you had some questions about that or if we didn't have time to answer some of your important questions. That'd be a good idea. And um, for some conclusion, let's kind of reflect back what we learned today, right? What you should be able to do now and also what the other few concluding steps. I'm not gonna share anything because I'll try to make it short and clear for that purpose. So today, and especially since most people didn't have much experience with time series, hopefully we had a quick and uh, but a productive dive into the topic, learn to do most of the basic operations with the uh, subject matter, right? So you should be able now to load and organize and process a time series data set and do some of the most important things like resampling and uh, smoothing that you might want to do in that case. I've given you a short introduction to how modeling in time series works. Of course, there's a lot more to it. And well, the good news, I also left some bonus materials for you in that notebook, which I totally encourage you to have a look at if you found it uh, interesting, but want to learn a little bit more. And also feel free to ask questions about that. Um, there are more things, many more things in time series beyond that though. So I wanted to give a few, well, tips that are mostly in my opinion of how to proceed further. And um, I think the most useful thing is actually about what not to uh, focus too much on rather than what to focus on because the latter you can uh, disagree on much more. Um, and I would say, um, very often when you browse information about time series, you'll find um, a lot on things like ARIMA and uh, applying LSTMs to time series, being neural networks. I would say leave that until much, much further in specific applications where you will really, really need that. In practice, right, you can very much suffice with things like we've shown you with building simple yet powerful custom models, reorganizing your data sets in such ways. Um, and one little thing that um, is gaining a lot more popularity since uh, recently is an uh, application called Profit developed by uh, Facebook, which is actually has proven to be one of the simplest yet most powerful uh, frameworks for time series forecasting. Now, I know there's a bit of controversy about it here and there, right? And people still disagree about its usability, but um, you should also see the name in the chat now. But if you want to quickly be able to make powerful uh, time series forecasts without reading whole books on you know, complicated modeling and needing to have a lot of subject matter on the topic, that would probably be my best tip in the field. And if you have doubts, uh, feel free to uh, look back into the materials we've shared today or maybe drop us a question. It's always an interesting subject to discuss. And otherwise, I thank you everyone for your attention, energy, and being here today. Hopefully everyone was able to learn something new and interesting and well despite the bits of technical challenges we might have had but that's always uh, attribute isn't it <laughs>